Hello and welcome to Switzer Investing. I'm Paul Ricard, filling in for Peter Switzer. Our first guest tonight is St. Wong. He's the portfolio manager for Prime Value, and uh, Peter Switzer interviewed him earlier today to talk in particular around how the banks have done in their reporting season and some of the other areas of the market he likes, particularly around some of the opportunities in insurance and transport stocks. And then the second part, I talked to Peter about an article he wrote today about high risk stocks and a couple of high risk strategies. And also, is it time to sell in May and go away, given it's the 15th of May? First up, here's Peter talking to St. Wong. Well, thanks, Paul. And now I'm joined by St. Wong from Prime Value. Great to see you, mate. Hi, Pete. Look, one of the questions I'm getting at right at the moment from lots of people is, should I sell in May and go away? And I'm sure you're getting the same kind of question. What are you telling the people who ask you that? Yeah, definitely, Pete. Um, you know, one of the key questions is after a big run in markets the last six months, effectively, do we go back to to the old days of um, but uh, sell in May and go away. Um, but, you know, you and I know that finance is not a science, uh, Pete, and unlike water freezes at zero and balls at 100, um, it's not guaranteed um, a picture that, um, you know, the markets will kind of uh, ease off or tank in May. So um, a lot of stuff has happened the last couple of months, predominantly um, the factoring in of potentially peaking in interest rates and perhaps even uh, cut in interest rates in the US by end of this year. So um, a lot have been factored into share prices. What I would say at this point, uh, my own uh, observation is that uh, markets somewhat uh, optimistic. Um, valuations have gone up to some extent uh, without the uh, corresponding earnings to follow that. So I'm a little bit defensive at this point, but nevertheless still finding opportunities to invest in the market. Mm. So you're not really selling in May. Are you looking to see if there is a sell-off as an opportunity to buy in May and effectively stay? Yeah, look, that's right, Pete. Uh, my position is um, keep some cash as an option on the sidelines, uh, keep the def keep portfolio somewhat defensive, diversified, but not overly bearish um, because in this market, it could still rally on. So I don't want to be caught out by having an extremely defensive position mm -hmm. such that if the market does run, I'm caught behind. So I'm keeping my options quite wide open keep cash on the sidelines, keep diversified, but at the same time, continue to look for opportunities and avoiding some of the stocks that I don't want to be invested in. Yeah, we might talk about that later on, but I guess an important observation uh, over the last few weeks is that the US data is starting to look like interest rates are, uh, interest rates are biting. You know, CPI, PPI was good last week. Consumer sentiment was was down pretty substantially. I'm sure the Fed is thinking, are we close to the top? Mm, absolutely. I think uh, that sentiment is uh, coursing through the market. Um, but what's interesting, Pete, uh, is when we look at the US reporting season, for example, we all know the numbers are quite poor on a relative basis, but shares um, you know, have rallied on the back of that, suggesting that perhaps the market's factored in quite a number of the negative things that we've been thinking about. Um, the pulse child, pulse sector, I guess, is the housing market in the US. So poor results from home builders in the US. Um, there's been some green shoots, but share prices of home builders have actually rallied quite substantially since the start of this year, up 30, 40% since the start of this year, okay. suggesting that perhaps the market is trying to look ahead or look backward. Mm, okay, let's go and look at an area, a sector of our market that a, a lot of investors are in and they like it. That's been under pressure lately, namely the banks, the big banks first. What's your view on the big banks? Yeah, look, Pete, um, we came into 2023 somewhat more negative on the banks, predominantly because uh, share prices had rallied. Uh, but in the last couple of weeks, we've seen quite a large rebase of earnings expectations for the banks predominantly a rebasing of what is called, I guess, net interest margins. 
because of competition in the mortgage sector and deposit sector. So shares with uh, with the likes of NAT, for example, um, ANZ and West Bank have come back quite a fair bit in the last couple of weeks. And I'm, I'm thinking that quite a fair bit of this has been factored into share prices, at least in the short term. So I think, you know, from banks yielding about 3.3%, sorry, that's a half year yield. So roughly just under 6% on average on a full year yield. That's looking quite decent from my perspective. Now, I'm not expecting the banks to run away from a share price perspective, uh, kind of like Telstra. I think I'm thinking that the banks become utilities in this environment. They're not going to crash. Uh, they're not going to give me a 20, 30% return either, but still I'm getting a pretty decent yield and they, become, they, they revert to utility type investment for me within the portfolio context. Mm. Okay. Um... How would you rate the big banks in turn? If you have to buy a big bank, what is your probably favorite buy? Tough question, Pete. I kind of divide my answer into two. One, I always go for quality, and that that's really a CBA. The best mm -hmm. deposit franchise on the market. Um, I know it's expensive, and that's what the pushback I typically get from you know large institution investors. It's most expensive bank in a bank, most expensive bank in the Aussie market. But look, in somewhat more challenging environment and still volatile environment, the best bank in the market typically wins out. And that's why I'm kind of sticking with uh, CBA at this juncture. But if I were looking for value, um, ANZ um, and to a lesser extent, Macquarie Bank, I think stands out from a value perspective. Um, ANZ, about 10 times earnings, you know, three times, three multiple cheaper than where, you know, likes of ANZ, uh, uh, NAB and uh, CBA is trading in on. So, so uh, there's probably some pocket of value in in ANZ from from my perspective. Okay, you threw Macquarie in. Uh, do you think Macquarie is the kind of because it's not like the big four banks? It's 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 the fifth biggest bank. But if we see a, a sort of a tech rebound in the US when interest rates are cut, do you think Macquarie will be a beneficiary of that kind of? Um, interest rate reduction in the US? I think so. I think um, one of the key reasons why Macquarie might be marked down a little bit is because of its, um, ironically, its um, asset management business, its annuity-based business. And that is really, to some extent, a function of interest rates. And one view in the market is perhaps with interest rates staying high, uh, their clients may be hard-pressed to raise funds, to invest, so if interest rate does come back, that narrative could, could be rolled back uh, from an from a asset management perspective. And I think from that perspective, Macquarie could actually be a, a beneficiary of that. Um, don't forget, last couple of months, last 12, 18 months, the um, capital market facing business had a really tough time. So should interest rates come off, you expect market acti activities to start to uh, improve and that sort of business, capital markets position, capital markets business, that should also improve on the back of uh, better market conditions as well. So I think all in what I'm saying here is that Macquarie is really diversified. Um, and I think it can ride through a number of market scenarios. Um, and I, I point towards the whole expert how entrepreneurial the bank is. And they seem to pop up with um, hundreds of million dollars worth of profit every year from different parts of the business. So um, I'm not ready to count against Macquarie Bank. Um, and that's because of the nature of the, the management team. Okay. Have you run your eyes over the smaller banks, namely Suncorp and uh, Bank of Queensland, which really has struggled in recent years? Yeah, look, Pete, I, I haven't. And that's because when I look at the industry structure, um, it's tough for the small guys. It's tough for the regional banks. It's tough for the non-bank financial institutions. You know, whether it's, it ranges from AFG, uh, Aussie Finance Group to Resimac, a small end of town, to anything between, it's tough for the small guys because of the level of competition in the market. So I'm staying on the sidelines at this point. Okay, let's go to um, some stocks that you've been adding to your portfolio and why. Sure. Uh, look, Pete, I've been adding in um, three buckets. Uh, first of all, the insurance sector continues to do quite well. Um, and what I refer to, to doing quite well is that 
premiums continue to rise, especially in likes of uh, commercial insurance. Uh, claims are really low, and that can see the case in the likes of health insurance. I'll come back to that as well. But I'm also invested in, I, I guess, what you call uh, pick and shovels, uh, the likes of uh, OS Brokers or AUB Group, which is insurance broking business. So I've been adding to the likes of QB Insurance in a large end of town, um, NIB Insurance, whose uh, ticket code is NHF in the health insurance space, uh, that being the fourth largest health insurer in the market, in the Aussie market, but also OS Brokers, just because it is a beneficiary of rising premium rates, insurance premium rates, without actually taking that risk. So that's one market I've been adding to, and I think it's going to be quite defensive in nature as well. The second uh, bucket I've been investing or increasing my investment in is really in the transport sector, um, specifically Lindsay Australia, ticker, ticker code is LAU, uh, a trucking business, uh, both um, haulage on the roads, trucks, and also uh, rail. It's really been a beneficiary of the amount of activity of plantings out of far north Queensland, which is really booming from an agriculture produce perspective but also because one of his key, I guess one of key players in the transport industry, uh, Scott's Transport has gone bankrupt and the likes of Lindsay is actually a beneficiary of this structural change in the marketplace. So it's still trading about 10, 11 times. So really cheap from my perspective and it seems reasonable um, in that sense. Uh, the last market I've been adding to is in the industrial space, uh, Orica, Limited Explosives, um, in, the, in the midst of increasing its uh, pricing contracts to its clients. So I'm getting that beneficiary of higher prices as they renew or renegotiate the, these contracts. And again, these contracts can't be, I guess, renewed all night. It takes time for a contract to conclude and restart the process. So that's, and Oracle has got some ways to go with that. So these are three buckets I've been investing in uh, in the market. Excellent, Matt. Thanks for joining us um, and sharing your your views on the market right now. Great. Thanks, Peter. Cheers. That's ST Wong from Prime Value. Joining me now is the one and only Peter Switzer. Peter, what are you doing in that garb and what are you doing in Queenstown? <laughs> well, I'm in this garb because I am in Queenstown. Uh, it's a remarkable uh, town in uh, New Zealand. It could be a city, I'm not quite sure. It seems small for, um, but based on what Sydney or uh, well, New South Wales or Australian cities are like, but gee, it's a beautiful place. I'm staying in a place called Eckhart's. It's been a historical uh, uh, hotel. Uh, it's a beautiful place. I'll, just pull, I'll swing this laptop mm -hmm. around so you can see the view that I'm looking at right now. That looks spectacular. Yes, it's, it's absolutely magical. So for people who've never been to Queenstown before, this place is quite extraordinary. And so I'm, I'm kind of dressed casually, but don't worry, I'm still on the money when it comes to looking at the market and uh, answering questions. Okay, speaking of money, you got to, can't let the dollar sign on the on the cap go by. So uh, yeah. what does that this, mean? <laughs> yeah, this is my, my own special cat. I um, got this made up in Thailand a few months ago. They, they knocked them up in 20 minutes in Thailand and I just couldn't resist having a cat with a dollar sign on it. After all, people do accuse me of being a money man. So but if a cat fits, I guess, Paul, wear it. Okay, enough of your travels. Now, today's the 15th of May, middle of the month. Uh, is, it, is this a year when it's uh, go away in May and come back again, uh, some ledger day, in other words, pack up shop for the next four or five months? What do you think about uh, that as a strategy for this year? You know, I guess if I was, if I was just investing and had no other sources of income, I could be really cautious now. I think there's going to be a, a few tricky months. You know, with the U US debt ceiling problem, Paul, that could really spook the market mm -hmm. a month or two. And I also think the banking crisis in the US still hasn't gone away. And I think with those two things, you know, potentially undermining the market, <clears throat> if I was a really cautious investor and all my money was invested, I think I would probably you know, sell down those vulnerable stocks. Um, but personally, from my point of view, I'm looking to buy in May or amazingly over now, but 
May and June, if there is a sell-off, I'd be buying and, and staying on the basis that when you, and you and I have talked about this, the US bond markets sort of tipping interest rate cuts towards the end of this year, which I think will be the, the prelude for the US stock market to go another leg up uh, in particularly end of 2023, rolling into 2024. So it'll be a buying opportunity, but I do think it's going to be a pretty risky time over the next couple of months. Now, uh, we'll obviously take our lead from the US market, but we're also going into June, which is uh, a time when typically we see some tax loss selling in Australia and also some of the super funds just rebalancing their portfolios. Do you think that's going to be a big factor this year? Oh, I think it would be a factor, Paul. Whether it's a big one another uh, argument. I think if we had the, the combined problem in June of a US debt concern and another mm -hmm. series of banks fail in the US, well, then I think there'd be A, a would be losses, therefore people would sell to make to eventually rebuy um, a month or two later um, uh, once we get into the new financial year. So this is going to, I think those two big things I mentioned, the US debt ceiling debate uh, and whether possibly the US defaults, I don't think they will, but there's always a possibility. Uh, I think remember in 2013, I think you and I were in Melbourne when um, the US debt was downgraded. The yep. market yep. did that for a short time. So I think we have to be prepared for that. But as I say, if that happens, I'd be a buyer of the sort of stocks that I think are going to be good rebounders come later this year. You wrote a story today, Peter, in the Switzer Report about some high-risk strategies. Can you just relate that sort of thinking back to what you've just been saying about uh, about May and time of year? Well, Paul, I think there's a, a number of really interesting um, themes that you can pursue when you're looking for high growth. And um, But I, I make the point in the, in the Switzer Report today that it's high risk as well. If you go for high growth, you're going for high risk. And it probably... Is the risk is a little bit higher at the moment because of the, the issues I brought up earlier, the US debt concern and the banking concerns. But it still could be a, a buying opportunity. So what I'm probably saying is if you see a sell-off, these things, these um, investment products, and I mentioned a couple of stocks as mm -hmm. well, but I think there's two really interesting uh, investment products out there, both of them at ETFs, which really could have fantastic magnification effects uh, over the next year or so. And I think, you know, if, 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 you, if I start off on one of the examples, I know you, you were going to ask me for a couple of examples. I think gear is a really interesting one. And Paul, you and I have looked at this in the, in the past for so us. So just explain what, what gear is, Pete. Uh, for yeah, those so, so gear comes from beta shares. And, and basically, it's, it's a collection of shares that's a pretty good representation of the ASX 200. And so, and I know I'm, I'm actually invested in gear. I, I bought it at, at slightly lower levels. <clears throat> and so, when, when I see the markets up, I, I tend to believe that gear will be up. And it tends to be up by a magnification effect, a bigger amount. Similarly, mm -hmm. when the market falls, that the fall is magnified on the downside as well. So it's a risky product, but if you get the timing right, of course, the best time, which uh, we've got the chart on screen, the best time to buy gear is after the coronavirus crash. I think it got down to around um, $12 or so, and it's now $24 or $25. And so I think these this is a, a really good uh, pro a product to buy if you're, if you're looking to try and get some great returns. And I do believe that the Australian stock market over the next 18 months, so end of this year, rolling into 2024, we're going to see some nice rises. I wouldn't be surprised to see 10 to 15% rises of the uh, ASX 200. And therefore, if you're in gear, you'll probably get 25, 30% gain. Paul? So it's a bit like a, a margin loan, but it's not a margin loan. It's just an ETF. It just buys or sell on the ASX and you get roughly twice the exposure. So uh, for every $100, if the market goes up 1%, gear should go up 2%. But you've got the downside risk as well, right? So you get the That's magnification right. on the downside as well. That's the risk, yeah. isn't it? I think if, if gear was around $27, $28 now, I wouldn't be talking. But because it's around around $25 or so, I think it's, it's probably a, a worth one, one, one to look at, particularly if there is a sell-off getting in with a product like this could be a, a, an interesting play. It's a high growth play. And let me emphasize, it's a high risk play as well.
Okay, let's go to the other one because when I saw this, uh, I almost didn't have a heart attack, Pete, <laughs> but I had a few palpitations. So talk about your other idea. Yeah, and this is a really, really risky idea. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's created by State Street, so it's a spider ETF, SPDR, and it's for the regional banks in the USA, which are having all the tr troubles at the moment. Uh, it's, its ticker code is KRE. Uh, my problem is, Paul, you can't get a hedge version of this from, yeah. from what I can see. I'll, I'll do a bit more research, but because uh, I think the Oz dollar is going to rise over the next year or so. So something like this will be the benefits if it if it's a good play um, will be undermined by the fact that the Aussie dollar will rise. But this thing is down about fifty percent um, this year. Now, for good reason. We saw Silicon Valley Bank fail. Mm -hmm. uh, regional, um, I was it no, First Republics had, had problems. Signature Bank failed, and there's still question marks over other ones. And so you can see why this is sold off. But as you know. Uh, this regional banks won't be on the outer forever. It might take a year, it might take two years, but when they do get forgiven, the market will roll into this thing again. And if you're down 50%, if it went back to its all time high, that would be a 100% gain. But as, as you know, this is a big risky play. Yeah, it sounds a little risky, but of course, uh, you know, that, as you say, it's come up a long way. And I guess you've got to say that uh, to look at that, that the, you know, how much lower can regional banks go? You know, are we through all the bad news or not? And that's probably why it's it's so down because the market thinks we're probably not. That's what I think the market's saying still. Yeah. Paul, I, I'm I'm thinking to myself, I want to see what happens with the US debt ceiling because mm. if that's a problem, I think banks will cop it, US banks will cop it and the regional will cop it the worst. But then I think it could be a really good buying opportunity if you're prepared to put, and you wouldn't put you know, a large amount into it, but it might be a nice small uh, investment and you wait two years. because. And by the way, I do think Washington will come to the rescue of these banks because they can't have this uh, uh, intermittent examples of runs on these banks without them coming and saying, listen, we're going to we're going to ensure the deposits of these organisations because we know they are not as risky as the community's thinking because they haven't got enough information. I think we're going to see that kind of thing coming out of Washington. Okay, just to wind up, Pete, uh, you listened to SD Wong's uh, discussion earlier. In fact, you interviewed him. Obviously, we're talking about banks and insurance companies. Yeah. His views on Macquarie. I know you've been a big fan of Macquarie. It's ex-dividend today. That's why it's often the market today. But uh, how would you describe the risk reward of investing in Macquarie at these levels at the moment? Yeah, look, Paul, I, I would have thought that Macquarie could have rebounded quicker than I thought. But I'm going to say, say to myself, and, and I'm a pretty big holder of Macquarie and bought it at much lower levels, so I don't really care about the current prices. But I do think that when we get past this interest rate rising cycle in the US, when we've uh, overcome those headwinds I talked about, debt ceiling and bank crises and all that sort of stuff, the, the US market will be set for a takeoff again and Macquarie will, will catch that, that tailwind and, and move back you know, across to the, the, you know, the high levels we've seen in the past. I think it's a great organisation. I think ST1 made the point that one part of his business might be challenged and all of a sudden they get hundreds of millions of dollars profit from another part of their business. I think they're a very, very innovative bank and they've got some very smart people, and I'm always happy to invest in smart people. Well, I agree with you, Pete. I think it's one of the outstanding buyers at the moment, but, you know, the market, uh, you know, has, has a bit of, you know, palpitations. Macquarie will also feel a little bit on the soft side, but certainly it's a stock for the long term. You live it up in, uh, in Queenstown. You'll be back at the same time, same yeah. channel next week. We'll talk to you then. Thanks for joining us, Pete. Cheers, mate. That's all for this week. Peter will be back next week. And don't forget to join us on Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern for Boom, Doom and Zoom. We'll see you then.